I believe that we can both unravel the mysteries of the universe and save human lives at the same time through interdisciplinary research. And I'm going to share with you today just one story, my story that has crossed these paths. And we start in the supernova remnant Cassiopeia A. It's one of the youngest ones in our galaxy, about 330 years old. And an astronomy colleague approached me one day, and she had over eight years of magnificent data just trying to understand the 3D structure of this nebula, the supernova remnant, but she had no way to look at it. So I looked with, at the data with her and said, I think I can help you. And although this, and this is all real data you're seeing on the sc screen above me, this is the Hollywood rendering version, but the rough draft I made with her looks something more like this. And she was able to make novel discoveries about how supernovas explode and how the shells explode within it using a piece of software developed at Brigham and Women's Hospital here in Boston called 3D Slicer. And it was originally developed for looking at patients' brain scans, doing surgical planning, and doing 3D renderings of anatomy. Who knew our solution was lurking just across the river? Now, people don't believe me when I tell them that astronomy and medical imaging, these two seemingly different fields, are really similar. So we're going to play a little game. I like to call it which is which. And I'll play this with new uh, doctors and astronomers I work with. I'm going to show you two images on the screen. One of them is biomedical, and one of them is astronomical, and you have to pick them correctly in your head. So here's the first set. And again, one of these is a biomedical and one is astronomical. I'll give you a second to make your little vote mentally. So it turns out the one on the left is some of the raw data of the supernova remnant we were just looking at. And on the right, we have an angiogram of a patient's heart and coronary arteries. Okay, we're going to try another one. Now, this one is much closer to my daily bread and butter. Now tell me which is which. And one of these is literally millimeters across, and the other is billions of miles. So it turns out the one on the left is a confocal microscopy image of a human cornea, and on the right we have a radio telescope image of the star-forming region NGC 1333. Now aside from the fact that these images look similar, and doctors trying to find like a tumor in a patient's brain or a young star forming is similar, the way the data comes from the machine or the telescope is remarkably similar. So here's a MRI scanner, and if you've never seen raw data of a patient's brain, this is what it looks like, and when the MRI scanners acquiring the data, it goes in slices. So you can see the patient's nose, their eyes, it kind of progresses towards the middle of the head. You can start to see the cortex, and it steps through to the back of the brain. Now, believe it or not, telescopes, and particularly radio telescopes, operate in a similar manner. And if we were to look at the raw data from these telescopes, we're going to look at a nebula called M16. And we start with this radio telescope at the front of the nebula, stepping back towards the middle of the nebula, just like the middle of the patient's brain. And those bright regions are where young stars are forming all the way to the back of the nebula, just like the back of the patient's head. Now, although the doctors are able to then take this data and look at it in 3D and do surgical planning, this is, just, this is like cutting edge just about as good as you get with any astronomer. And this is what they have to look at to understand the three-dimensional structure and velocities momentum in our universe. But we can do better. So you might recognize this nebula more like this, the famous Hubble image of the Pillars of Creation or the Eagle Nebula. And I'm going to fade this out onto a radio image. It's a false color in the background. And fade away the Hubble image you're used to. Uh, but we don't need to just look at this in 3D. We can look at it in 2D. And here I'm using a radiology toolkit called OSIRIX. When I showed this astronomer, Mark Pound, whose data this is, he was amazed because he had been trying so hard to study the impact of a young group of stars. And he had this theory that there was this wind crashing and tossing the pill pillars over. And it took a month to prove this with conventional visualization. But in one shot, you can see the shockwave of wind blasting through across to the left-hand side of the screen. 
Now, I don't think myself or any of my collaborators would have anticipated how far this has gone. And by sharing the medical technology with astronomy and astronomy with medical, we've been able to find new stars and supernova remnants and revolutionize how you do heart diagnostics and look at uh, data for different patients and organize it and data mine it. Now, I don't have time to show you all these great projects, but I'll show you one of them. And this is a collaboration I've been working on called the Multiscale Hemodynamics Project uh, and working with doctors at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Now, what this represents is a novel way of doing heart disease diagnostics. And instead of the conventional uh, invasive angiography, this is just a CT scan. And what you see here are the coronary arteries. So if you have your heart and the arteries wrap around the outside, these are the arteries you worry about getting blocked and giving you a heart attack and killing you. So it's really important that we look at them. Now, this is a CT scan of a patient with a blood flow simulation, that's the coloring up there. That simulation was originally developed for studying the structure of DNA. And then the visualization was done with a toolkit called VISIT, originally developed for physics simulations. Interdisciplinary. Now, my assignment was to try and come up with a new way of looking at this to make it optimal for the doctors in the hospital. How can we make it the most efficient for them for a diagnosis? And I came up with this image. Uh, it's 2D. What I did is I took the whole artery and collapsed everything into a 2D plane. Now, I got some very quizzical looks when I showed this to the doctors originally, but I was inspired to do this representation for my astronomy work, where we've been using these tree diagrams, we call them along the bottom, to understand the structure of nebula. Well, we were inspired in that work from the bioinformatics and genome community, where they use these tree diagrams to understand their gene expression data. They were inspired by the evolutionary biologists who use these tree diagrams to understand how species evolve and are related, the first of which was drawn by Sir Charles Darwin. And here's an example from his origin of the species. So straight from Darwin through biology, physics, astronomy, back to medical imaging, interdisciplinary. Now you may say, well, is this 2D representation better? Well, I did a study at Harvard Medical School to answer just that question. And it turns out if you present the image on the left to a doctor, on average they find about 39% of the high-risk regions that could er explode or block your heart or kill you. On the right, we can do a little better, and they're able to find 62% of these high-risk dangerous regions. But we can do even better simply by changing the colors. So the rainbow color map is a sin most doctors and astronomers and physicists are guilty of using. And, <laughs> and it doesn't focus the best qualities of your visual system. The human system can see brightness variation, contrast, not really good at that whole green, yellow, blue thing. But now if you look at these shades of red and highlight the regions that are most diseased with dark red, now a doctor can find 91% of the high-risk regions simply by changing the colors. And I would have never known the importance of color if it was not for my computer science and visualization collaborators showing this to me. So again, interdisciplinary collaboration. Now, how do you even get a collaboration like this? In the case of astronomical medicine, it started with a Harvard astronomy professor, Alyssa Goodman, serendipitously meeting a computer scientist and imaging specialist from Brigham and Women's Hospital and their recruitment of a very adventurous, open-minded young student. And from there, it has exploded, and we've pulled in cardiologists and computer scientists and radiologists and astronomers, physicists, chemists, computational physicists. I mean, we've brought so many people together and has been enlightening to share domains and information across borders. And we're still going, and although most of the people up on the screen are from Harvard or Harvard Med, now we cross different institutions and continents to work together. And all I can say is it's just been wonderful. We're continuing to make new discoveries. And I just urge you, attend conferences not in your own domain. Read books and journals not in your own discipline. Watch TED Talks and come to events like this and say hi to the neighbor sitting next to you because you really never know where your next great idea is going to come from. Thank you.